This week on A to Z Running, top 10 Olympic trials marathon finisher Nathan Martin joins the show again to relay his amazing experience at the trials as well as his recent journey leading him into it. We answer a listener question about VO2 max and heart rate. In the world of running, USA and British Indoor Championships were impressive. Records continue falling. And another record breaker is down for the count amidst scandal. All this and more on A to Z Running. Welcome back to the A to Z Running Podcast, where we help runners thrive with information, inspiration, and coaching and training services. I'm Andy. And I am Zach. And remember that you can learn everything you need to know about what we do and the support and services we offer at A to Z Running.com. And then find us on the places where you like to find stuff. And we are most easily findable on Instagram, YouTube, and Spotify. Yes, we like to connect with you in all those places, and we look forward to doing it more and more, and we're looking forward to Rivertown races, seeing some of you in person, too. In fact, we'll have a lot more to say about that as things come and come closer to it. A quick note about the interactions, too. A number of you occasionally will send us a note and say, hey, I just really appreciate when you were saying this thing or talking about this topic because it has helped me in this way, and we really are grateful for those kinds of follow-up comments because they really tend to um, help the human side of the, you know the thing that because we're just sitting here befi- behind a microphone, right? But it's like you know it's great to hear that um, your experiences have been positive in some sense. And so on that note, I'll just a quick a, a quick one because this came from it was a couple of weeks ago now, but um, I just wanted to mention because he had sent a follow up. One of the listeners by the name of Stuart had asked a question on the podcast. And then after the fact, after we had shared some thoughts, sent an additional note of follow up to just simply say that he is really grateful for the conversation about understanding your own body as you're training and knowing based on effort, how much you can exert and things like that. And he expressed gratitude for that as someone who has moved away from running for a time and then come back mm-hmm. to it. And it, and he feels like it has been valuable to him to come back better because of that. I, I think cool. there's something to that. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Thank you for sharing, Stuart. Yeah. Speaking of which, let's get on to your questions. Remember that you can ask questions very easily. You just say them and you've asked a question. But also you can ask questions for A to Z running even more easily than other things because you can send your questions via email to questions at A to Z running.com. Just send an email to questions at A to Z running.com. We love to hear them. We do. Like this one from a listener. This one from a an anonymous listener, and you can ask questions anonymously too, by the way. It's not terribly difficult to simply say, ah, don't say my name, just say my question. And we're glad to respect that. But this question came um, on on the topic of heart rate. So here shared, I have been wondering, questioner asks, what my current true max heart rate is and wondered your thoughts on getting that measured. I'm not sure what my max heart rate is currently. I have some wild guessing, but thought getting it actually tested would be the best route. And is it a waste of time for someone in my current fitness to know exactly what it is? Or should I find a steep hill and just do the hard repeats and get the the data there? Um, And then that further in the exchange here, there was an additional question about doing something similar with VO2 max as well. Um, And so should, should I test my max and VO2 max? heart rate stuff. Um, that's a worthwhile question because if it makes a big difference and it, it's worth knowing and it's not hard to test, these are things that can be figured out quite easily in a lab. So for instance, um, if you were to go to like a performance lab or, a, uh, um, what are they called? Some kind of sports lab <laughs> where they, um, you know, they put you on a treadmill, they hook you up to a couple of different machines 
and they're going to run you through. It takes about 20 minutes. They're going to run you through a few things. Yeah, it's good to warm up first, by the way. Um, they're going to run you through a number of things, and then they're going to prick your finger and take uh, you know, a, um, a blood lactate sample and some other things to just to get a, a good comprehensive round of data. But within all of that, producing something like uh, an accurate max heart rate measurement as well as a VO2 max measurement, those things, easily done. Um, so that said, if you wanted to know those things, it's probably not too difficult to find out. You got to find a place that does some of that stuff. Um, however, the question here from the listener and the question we want to dwell on for a moment is, is there value to know what, like, should I know those things? Um, thank you for asking. So our, our first, um, first general question was something like this is if I knew that stuff, what would I do differently as a result? Or how would that change my behaviors? Um, and the, the answer here ultimately that we're going to give is simply not, not much. It wouldn't change much for you, but it could change a few things. And is, are those few things helpful? I think one of the things people are concerned about is if they're pushing themselves hard enough, I think with the like whole Mac to not know going their max. hard enough. Right. They're concerned they're going too easy. Yeah. You're not. Usually you're not. <laughs> But that's that's a simple answer because too easy still produces the same results as harder. It's just well, not the same slower. Results. Yeah, it, it, they just produce them there's less a range. quickly over time. So if you were going too easy for a long period of time and you were much more optimized, it's true that you would likely see better results. But at the same time, it's just as possible that you're going to overdo it and see worse results. And so if, if you stay beneath the line, is kind of always our point, there's a line somewhere of overtraining. And if you stay beneath it, even if you're a little bit more beneath it than you have to be, you're going to be able to produce positive results and, in fact, may be the same positive results that you would if you were training just a little bit harder. Yeah, and Zach's not talking about like running all your stuff easy. He's saying like when you're doing a hard effort being on the the lower range of the effort range that we're right. looking for. Does that make right. sense? <laughs> yeah. So if you're doing if you're talking three types of efforts, um minimal effort, somewhere in the kind of the mid range effort and really high level effort, we think you should be doing all of those kinds of things over the course of training. But doing them less than you potentially could if you really did like perfectly optimized what you're doing. And that's fine in our opinion. Um, and I don't think that that's, I think, I think there are plenty of other approaches out there that really try to optimize more and really dial it in that are great. Um, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that ours is like a better approach, but for the vast majority of us, ourselves included as runners, um, we don't have access to the level of optimization that produce it. So case in point, you've heard all about the Norwegian method. Everyone's talking about the Ingebrigtsens and the Norwegian method. And they literally do like blood lactate testing during workouts. They're pricking their finger constantly in between intervals or in, in, in the midst of um, threshold training. And they know based on that measurement how much uh, exertional side effects, and that's not the right word, but um, with the stuff our body produces when we're overexerting, they know what's present, right? Basically, um, it's the ions in our in our bloodstream producing lactates or some of those kinds of things. So they know that, which means they know that they can go harder still, go longer still, or they need to shut it down um, at every moment throughout the workout, every key moment. I don't think anyone should do that. I think that's that's overkill. Um, and I think it's counterintuitive. Well, it literally is counterintuitive because you're you're taking the intuition out, the intuition out, and replacing it with a science, which is has a place. It does in sport in general, in, in physiological optimization certainly. Um, but my point is, without level of access to that kind of a degree of optimization, most of our attempts to optimize are not actually as precise as they should be to be truly reliable optimization. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say stay behind the line because you're probably not exactly where you think you are or where you should be perfectly all the time anyway. So let's talk Those about Those numbers that. change actually. That is in fact the big concern here. So listener question, um, now kind of bringing us to the heart of the thing again, what changes if I know my max heart rate? And one of the things we got to remember is, okay, so like VO2 max, heart rate based stuff, 
Um, these things, in fact, do fluctuate. That's what Andy said. They change. So your VO2 max is not the same all the time. It changes based on your fitness. That's why VO2 max is a fitness measurement. It tells you whether or not you are progressing because you know if it's better or worse than what it's been in the past. Um, and it does fluctuate. It doesn't, it, it's not like infinitely um, improvable. And so there are ceilings. There are ceilings of like window of fluctuations. It'll decrease only so much in zero activity. Um, so like if you just sat on a couch for a month straight, it'll only decrease so much. And then it really will just stop decreasing. And it usually is after about two weeks. Um, and But then at the same time, over like a seriously long period of time, it would change further. Um, but within that same sense, you're only going to see a certain amount of increase also before it kind of just stops increasing. And that's not to suggest that you are no longer able to improve as a runner when your VO2 max ceiling is reached, but that's only one layer of what makes you achieve performance capacity. So that once again, this goes to another thing, which is a very different thing, but um, you know the watches tell you the information like here's your training effect and your training effect is basically the watch's guess about how much positive influence the current current thing you're doing has having. Um, yet at the same time, that training effect measure is based almost solely on heart rate produced metrics and estimations like VO2 max. In that case, it's an estimation, but it's still, they're decently accurate. Those, those watch algorithmic VO2 max estimations. They're not bad. The studies all show that they're pretty close to the truth when you test it in the lab at the same time. However, that isn't the whole picture. And <laughs> that's the point that I was just saying. So if you know your current VO2 max in a lab, and if you know your current max heart rate and try to base what you're doing off of what your heart rate monitor says in training, that can be misleading. Old data. Old data. Now, side note, yes, we know that max heart rate technically is fixed. It does not change. Um, As you get older, well, it changes. It, Yes, it decreases. <laughs> Your max heart rate only does one thing. It goes down. Um, but keep in mind that the, the actual concept when we're talking about heart rate based training and what watches do with zones and stuff is not based on true max heart rate. It's based on heart rate reserve maximum uh, because that's actually a more clear picture of what I can do, what's possible, because you can't actually, you can't run at your max heart rate for any sustainable amount of time, any true max heart rate, which is why when your watch starts telling you you've been running 200 beats per minute for a while, you know that something's wrong because you'd be close to dead if you really were running at 200 beats per minute, unless you're like 25 years old, I guess. But uh, point is, so there's another metric and that metric heart rate reserve incorporates your resting heart rate to produce a true measurement. Again, it's going to be some kind of estimation from your watch if you're getting getting this from the watch because it's not actually testing your resting heart rate perfectly. But the same point is it's consistently close, just like VO2 max. Heart rate reserve based on resting heart rate, resting heart rate changes as your fitness changes, as well as changes as you are more and less healthy so or more and less stressed. Truth be told, your resting heart rate will be very, very different if nothing else changes except that you are under a substantial amount of mental or emotional stress mm. or both. Um, and, and so as a consequence, all of those metrics that we just said and knowing the exact data as they are presented ultimately does not still give you a clear picture of what you should be doing day to day unless you are gathering that information constantly, which goes back to the point of truly optimizing these things requires a level of an interaction with the data that we just simply don't think is practical. And most people can't do anyway. So I don't think it changes anything is my end conclusion here. And I appreciate listener your question because um, it, if it did change something, it would be worth pursuing because these things are not hard to test. Um, however, if it doesn't change much, then what we what we arrive at here is the question of what's the thing that can get me better able to optimize day-to-day -day training most consistently and most effectively and you know what we're about to say it's effort-based training that's intuitive not data-based training that's scientific and i'm not saying that 
the one is bad and the other is good. I'm saying that the one is going to get us to the desirable finish line better over time. So that's why we pursue it. Thank you, Zach. Now let's get on to something else helpful. Today, we are pleased to have a special guest on the show, a Michigan native, someone we've had on the show before because he was that good, Nathan Martin. This was his third trials, Olympic trials marathon that we're talking about today. He was seventh place this time. This is his best finish, best time. He ran 211 flat. I also want to mention a recent performance that is incredibly impressive, the 2023 Grandma's Marathon with a fourth place and a time of 2 10 45. Nice. Nate also in 2021 at the New York City Marathon, he finished eighth place. So he's had several top 10 performances at US Championships. He's also a coach. So there's a lot to unpack with Nate today. Let's get to our interview with him. Hi, Nate. Welcome back to the A to Z Running Podcast. We're so excited to have you. I have returned. Um, obviously after doing a few extra things since the last time, but definitely excited to be here for sure. Yeah, you are one of our audience's favorites. So we were especially excited to get to catch you here after the Olympic trials where you were seventh. So congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. It, it definitely was one of those things where it's like bittersweet. Um, but honestly, an awesome day, awesome opportunity and and at the end of the day, awesome outcome. So a lot to be proud of. And we're going to unpack that today. And I'd like to start, just jump right in with your preparation for this race. I know that you had some changes and you came off of a PR fairly recently. So things were going well. I'd love to hear your process through the Olympic trials preparation. Um, yeah. So you're just saying like the couple months leading up to it, the, the six months, year, what? I kind yeah, of let's do a year. Yeah, let's look at like, a year. Oh, oh gosh, a whole year, man. You're going to have me going through a whole bunch of stuff. So like I want to say a little over a year ago, I ended up switching coaches, you know, and Dante was a fantastic coach. Um I think we just um got to the point where he took me as far as he could, kind of a little bit different philosophy on things. Um and so that's kind of when I connected with James McCurdy who um he has the McCurdy train program. And kind of brought me on board and said, hey, I have a few different ideas. I believe we can get you to this X point. And so we started off doing just some general stuff. I'm nothing like too different than what I was doing, kind of leading into grandma's. But just my headspace, all that kind of stuff was like really good um, and ended up having a fantastic race, hitting my PR, um, all that kind of stuff. And then at that point, it was like, okay, well, the trials are coming up. How do we prep for that? What do we need to do? So initially, the plan was to to just kind of focus on a half, get as fast as we could, and then take all that momentum into the trials. Um, but an opportunity popped up to run New York again. And it was one of those things where it was like kind of hard. It's like, hey, is another marathon smart right now? Should we stick to the half marathon plan? But ultimately decided to run New York and didn't go bad or anything like that. But definitely it's very hard from going from one marathon to the next and then even into another one type thing. <clears throat> but came off of that and said my coach had been kind of alluding to it and talking about it like, hey, you need to come to Flagstaff for a couple months. Um, you need to get in some, at least some quality training around here, get some altitude um, adaptations and I think if we can do that, we can get you ready for the trials. Because um, before that point, I knew I had a shot to be top 10. But it was one of those things where it's like, well, maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. But I just didn't want to leave anything on the table. And I wanted to know that I was doing everything I could to to get ready for it. So I think December, like pretty much the start of December, I went down to Flagstaff to train. And oh my goodness, that process was so insane just with the difference in training, the increase in everything. Like the first month, it was just, I was constantly tired, just trying to keep up with everything. Um, and it was one of those like situations where you're like, oh man, is this actually helping me or is this like kind of hurting things? But um, I trusted my coach a lot. Um, eventually I started being able to handle being an altitude, handle the workouts, increase in, vo increase in volume, all that kind of stuff. And 
um, yeah, it, it kind of like completely changed my outlook. I went from, hey, I think I have a shot to be top 10 to, oh, wow, I, I legitly have a shot to to make the team. And so that kind of became my focus and prepping for that, just making sure I, I you know, did what I could for that opportunity and um, ultimately led me into the trials and kind of the race I had, so. As I'm hearing you talk about your building and confidence, you're going from like, I think I can to I know I can to then towing the line on race day. So I'd like for you to talk us through your race strategies, what you were thinking going into the race and how you were putting yourself in it. Uh, like leading up to the race, like the few weeks before um, I ended up getting sick. Um, and it definitely was like one of those like things that were it wasn't like, oh, it's a small cough. It was like I was in bed for a few days. So that that kind of messed with my confidence and how I was thinking for a bit. But again, my coach did a fantastic job just prepping me and telling me, hey, these are things we need to think about. And so um, like leading into it, there was that little bit of nerves like, oh, snap, is this going to affect things? Um but like it was probably three or four days before the race, I just um, was a lot more calm about things and said, hey, my fitness is still there. I'm still ready and I need to be ready to fight regardless um, to the situation. And so, um, you know, and it is crazy once you get there because you'll hear a lot of people talking about their strategy or things they're hearing. Um, and all this kind of stuff. And it's it's like if you're if you're focused on your game plan, that stuff kind of fades away um, type thing. But, um, yeah, just kind of hearing all that stuff um, just kind of reaffirmed that, hey, um, don't pay attention to what doesn't matter. Pay attention to what does. And so, yeah, just going into into race day, like obviously the nerves are there, all that kind of stuff. But I was ready to execute, ready to to challenge whoever. You have these big goals, right? Like you are in it. You are one of the top contenders. You are one of the best in the country. And so how do you translate that confidence and belief into a race strategy? So the biggest thing, yeah, just going into the race was being willing to accept however it unfolded. And so I I knew that there might be a chance that people decided to kind of go for the um, opening up another spot. And so like my my headspace was more like, hey, if that happens, just be ready for it. And if you feel confident, go with them. And so in the race, like, yeah, Zach Panning went around five or something like that. And it was just kind of a swarm of people. And I'm like, hey, I'm not going to miss my shot. I feel good. And oh, my goodness, like it was it was pretty insane, like through the through even like halfway, like even with the times we were clipping off, I never felt like, oh, wow, this is too much. I may I may have made a mistake. It wasn't until like the later stages where it kind of hit me. I'm like, oh, man, how in the world did I kind of finish? But. Um, it was just the biggest thing uh, was just being ready for whatever moves are made and not afraid to to kind of tackle those moves regardless to to what the outcome might be because of it. So that is so key when you said that what however it would unfold, you were going to be ready for it. And I think that that is incredibly important because, it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, like you are ready to suffer. Like you are ready to work hard to go to, go to battle. And mm -hmm. whatever that looked like, whatever moves were made, you're ready to battle. Um, at what point were you feeling the battle? And um, how did you respond mentally? Yeah, so around 11, um, I started feeling a bit fatigued. Um and, you know, I don't know whether it was like because of the pace, the heat, the where we were on the course. But I'm like, oh, wow, there's a lot of race left. And this is not the spot where I want to start questioning is this pace too fast. Um, but I think it lasted for like maybe half a mile. I was able to recollect myself, um, get back with the pack and start racing again. And so around 17. Um, somewhere around there, I think 
one more surge was made. Um, and that's when I kind of dropped the pack because we were already under um we were already under like four fifty pace or something like that, at least through the last like eight miles or something. And um yeah, when when that happened, I'm like, oh my goodness, I am getting tired. Um, and so a couple people kind of dropped off at that point. I'm like, well, these are the people I need to fight with right now to either try and get back to the pack or, or not just completely fall off. So I think the, I think it was Galen Rupp and then I forgot who else kind of fell off the, the, the kind of chase pack for the opening up the spot. And I was able to get past Galen um, and the other person. And at that point, I was like in no man's land. And so at 19, just it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, oh, my goodness, I have seven miles left. How in the world do I finish? And at this point, like you're thinking, yeah, my shot's probably gone. Um, all these kind of emotions are like kind of popping up. And it's not like you're thinking about these things heavily because there's so many other factors like drawing your attention, but it's just things that creep into your head. But then, you know, I start hearing people say stuff like, hey, um, you never know. You have to keep fighting. And I'm like, oh, wow. No, you're right. I definitely have to keep going. And um, so, yeah, I just kind of powered through the last seven to do what I could and Luckily, I was able to finish with a solid time and still overall good day. Yeah, and that is really where the victory is at right there. When you see the group separating and you choose to continue to battle and get the most out of yourself on that day to finish top 10, which was your original, like, can I do it? Can I not? Right? Like mm -hmm. two years ago you might have not had that same belief because you've put in all this work and you've translated that into great racing. You've continued to progress. And that's another amazing thing about you is the continual progression. But in that moment where you have to make that decision to continue to battle, what do you tell yourself in that moment? Because you you said you like listened to some of the, the people on the sidelines saying, you never know, you never know. What was the thought that you kept bringing back to stay in the fight? I mean, the biggest thing is, is I just did not want to give up and I just hated the idea of doing that. So, you know, I'll say stuff like, come on, Nate Martin and, and all these like small things to just keep myself just pushing forward. But hey, I just looked and said, hey, and again, like people kind of saying, hey, don't give up. I just thought, well, if I can get to the next person, then I'm going to try type thing. And so. Yeah, the I guess the biggest thing is is just refusing to to just give up even though things are starting to hurt, um, my shots gone and all that kind of stuff. And you made so much of the day by running two eleven, which is a really fast time, and getting seventh place. So that that was a huge victory. Now, in our previous podcast with you, you said one of your mantras was find a way. What mm -hmm. are some ways that you did that during this race? What are some of the ways that you found uh, a way? Things like um, just getting to the end and, and thinking about, um, you know, the people who came to support me and, and just fighting for them. Um, what other things? And it's like one of those hard things to think back, like what was I actually thinking about um, during that time? Um, just thinking, hey, you're at the, the biggest race of your life or at least the biggest race for, for the U S and all that kind of stuff. And everybody's suffering out here. And so, yeah, cause initially like it was one of those things like, Oh man, are people going to pass me now? Yeah. I just, yeah, it's kind of hard to reflect and think back exactly what I was thinking, but just some of those just general things. So. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say, it's a perspective thing. This race will end, just get to the finish. Other people are out here supporting me. I am going to continue to battle. Other people are suffering. I'm not, this is not a unique experience to me. Like they're also suffering and I have just as much a shot. So this, this perspective that you have, but also when you say it's like hard to think about exactly what you're thinking, I think that that is also a part of running, right? Because you've already trained yourself to endure this discomfort. So you mm -hmm. do what you've been doing for years and that is training yourself to keep in it through discomfort. Would you say that you often will wrestle with this kind of thing during training? And if so, like, how do you 
develop yeah. this because obviously you've developed it yeah. to a really amazing degree to where you can put yourself through these challenges and have a great day even though you're you're suffering for a while yeah so i mean i guess i'd say like the biggest thing just with running in general um is i really enjoy pushing myself um and kind of testing my limits like even when i was in flagstaff like the amount of times that my coaches would be like hey you just need to slow down you don't need to go this fast and it was like making me angry because I'm like, well, I feel good or I feel different than you think I feel. And I want to go faster and I want to want to test where I'm at right now. Um, and so I think just having that mindset was was one of the things that got me through because, um, you know, even though it was, again, an incredible amount of pain and like to the point where like, man, how in the world do I finish? I still was willing to, again, yeah, endure it because I wanted to get to my limits and, and finish the race knowing that I gave everything I had. A trademark of Nate Martin. <laughs> Working all the way oh. to the end, being able to do it well, suffer to the finish line. So as you think about, this is something Zach and I talked about, something that's so impressive about you is that you continue to progress. Because a lot of people have stagnant times or times that things don't go as well, especially when there's big changes. You know, and you've had a lot of big changes. So how do you think that you've been able to manage this continual progression of success? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, foundational things. You know, first, just again, the willingness to keep pushing my body, just being like any kind of athlete, you know, you're always like testing yourself. And sometimes that just gets hard. You're like, oh, man, I have to wake up and I have to run hard again or whatever and, and sometimes just a lot of people they just can't keep doing it but you know I've never there's definitely been times where it's been super hard to just get in the run or get in the effort but at the end of the day just because I want to know that I'm pushing myself and I'm reaching my potential I keep fighting for that and then also just being very fortunate to to just have great people in my corner who believe in me and what I can accomplish. And so I don't have to do all the the leg work or the energy thinking on what is it going to take to get to the next step. You know, I'll trust my coaches with that. And all I have to do is put forth that same energy to to push and fight. And, and yeah, hopefully it produces things. And obviously it, it has. So those are the two biggest things I kind of follow. And yeah, it's worked so far. Yeah, it, it has <laughs> worked wonderfully. Um, so if you put your coach hat on for a second, because you also coach, what is something that you would tell your athletes and us, all of us who are listening right now about how to push yourself in a race like this, how to come out on the other end and be satisfied, but also still hungry? The biggest thing is the results don't matter. They, they honestly don't. What matters is the, the fight you gave um, to produce those results because you can't control how fast people are. You can't control the weather, the conditions. Really, the only thing you can control is the effort you put in, and then that will produce the result. Um, you know, a lot of people focus on, hey, I need to win because of X reason. But, you know, like that kind of thinking to me, you know, causes a lot of stress. It it makes it so now other people are in control of what your goals are. And that's not a place you ever want to be in. You always want to be in control of what you're trying to accomplish. And so I think that's, yeah, what I what I would say. And that was deep. That was good. And, and I totally agree with you there. As soon as we can separate what other people are doing from our satisfaction in our own training and in our own racing. I think that's where the true freedom is found, but also where we are able to unlock our potential because it does, it's not based on anybody else's results. That's really profound, Nate. Well, congratulations. Our time is coming to a close and I wish it wasn't. So maybe we'll have to have you on for a trifecta. <laughs> But it's always a pleasure, Nate. We are we are big fans of what you're doing in the sport and we'll continue to keep our audience updated. Do you, do you have anything? I, this is the worst thing to ask someone who's just running. <laughs> but do you have anything on, on the schedule, on your horizon that you're able to share? Um, Nothing set in stone right now. Um, the biggest thing is, again, just figuring out um, what the next step is to get better. 
Um, obviously, balancing life, um, things like coaching, um, how does that play into everything? Um, you know, some like personal goals I have to do just like in my life, like how does it all kind of come together? Um, and so that's really what shapes things and nothing has formulated yet. Um, but ultimately just trying to get better and just see, see what that produces. So. Well, we love your overarching perspective. It's been super helpful. I'm inspired and motivated by the things that you shared and the things that you've done, Nate. So thank you for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for having me. You guys honestly always do a fantastic job and definitely glad to get on a podcast It's Michigan based, all that kind of stuff and, and spread the word of running and all that kind of stuff. But you do a good job without me. So, you yeah. know, um, but hopefully I can do my part to help too. Definitely better with you on it. Thanks, Nate. <laughs> Nate, congrats again on the, the thing, <laughs> all of it. Um, I gotta say, so we 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 said in the in the introduction, and he's he's shared some of his experiences here. Um, top ten finishes in marathon majors and all that kind of stuff. You have to understand, listeners, that a seventh place finish at the U.S. Olympic Trials is a way more impressive result than an eighth place finish at New York City Marathon. And you're going to say, "What? No, that's a marathon majors. It's got tens of thousands of people." Here's why: because in the U.S. Marathon Trials, you take the 200 best marathoners in the United States and put them in a single race. None of these other races have that level of saturation. They've got four or five of great runners from this place and four or five great runners from this place. And you get about 25 like highly elite level runners in a marathon majors race and certainly many other in extreme talents. I'm not saying they're not, but the point is that level of saturation is just simply uncommon in any other setting except for outside of like world championships and Olympics, which even then is actually not true because the world championships and the world champs and Olympics only allow for three from each nation, which you well know means that more than those three are plenty of other world-class talents that could have won that race in any day. So point being seventh in the trials is huge. And I know Nate, I know that you, you're right there and you know that on the right day, bittersweet, that's a said. top three finish. I know that I get it. But you got to walk away from this one knowing that you just did a huge thing. And it doesn't mean you don't have another chance to do it again the next time around. So let me say one more thing because Nate's talking about, you know, can't control other people, comparing ourselves to other people. And, and you know that we totally agree with that. But I have to at least say as uh, college rivals in a sense, Nate and I, and we graduated the same year from college or, or very nearly. It was like right around the same year. But um and, and just being able to kind of walk alongside his career from a distance and see this progress and this growth. And Nate, your, your progression over the years has been inspiring and daunting as well for those of us who have aspired toward progress ourselves and not seen the degree of success. But you have just – you have walked this road that is so hard to travel, which is one of things have not just happened for you instantly – it's been a slow and, and, and constant grind to progress to that next step and then to that next step. And it's just so exciting to continue to see that. And here in a seventh place finish after what was just an incredible two years of marathoning and just continues that progress. I hope that you don't feel like you're done progressing oh, in he your doesn't, mind. No, 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 I know. But I'm saying I hope you don't feel that because it's not even close you've got so much going there so thank you for coming on the show for sharing your your thoughts your experiences and for being an inspiration to the many many other runners who mm -hmm. see what you've done and where you've been able to grow and are just really excited to continue to see it yeah and we'll keep our audience updated also all of you we want to keep you updated on nate Mar martin's running career as it unfolds so let's get on to the world of running. There's a lot going on for indoor track. Yeah. So indoor track is like a three week season. <laughs> it seems like <laughs> it's it. just the way it goes. Cause it really is not a high priority for pro runners. Um, but it still is a thing. And so what ends up happening because we've got, especially in an Olympic year, you really don't want a long season right now because runners are thinking about the 
outdoor track season, which is really where where their focal point's going to be. But they still want to race, and many want to race simply for the sake of having a kind of a, a checkpoint in the process here. Um, but then also because it is still an international competition, and so we do have a World Indoor Championships, which is an opportunity for um, certainly achievement for the runners. But it's just not very long. It's three I was weeks gonna, long. I think I asked you, and I don't remember if you responded about it, but how do they have a World Championships the same year as the Olympics? I thought that you weren't supposed to be able to have both in the same year. Well, no, that actually happens. I think almost every Olympics has a With World Indoor, a world indoor oh. Championships. I guess so, I just never realized that they coincided. That it seems kind of odd to me. Yeah. So, like, World Indoor Championships – is on a rotation just like World Outdoor Championships. And so it does not happen every year. It's actually just about every other year, which is kind of the way these things go. Um, but that rotation is supposed to be opposite the Outdoor Championships so that a runner could theoretically focus more on one in a year when they don't have to worry about the other as much. But it, but it's not exactly like that. And with an Olympic year being obviously even more important than a World Championships year for the athletes, um, it's a little bit strange, but what we have to keep in mind is that it also makes sense to have a kind of major focal point now because the normal track season most years with all of the Diamond League, with all that kind of stuff, like runners are just out there doing a lot. But on an Olympic year, they tend to be a little bit less adventurous with how much they're competing and with travel. How, <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah, with how much they're traveling. And so you do see just a little bit like you're not you're not usually getting as many runners doing like world record attempts in an Olympic year. You're not getting as many people going to as many different events. And that's not necessarily the case. I think if you look at each Olympic year, it's probably been very different depending on. Well, this one, we've already had a lot of world records. So, (laughs) yeah, well, and that's what I'm saying is this is kind of a time when people are going to do that more because they're going to back off from it a bit. Oh, I see what you're saying when they start focusing on the Olympics. Sure. So it may be, but not always, and not for every runner. And that's the other thing about all of this is these multiple layers. You've got cross country championships. You've got a new world road championships now, which um, was inaugurated last year in 2023. And then we've got outdoor track, and then you've got an Olympic year as it comes and goes. And what it amounts to is opportunities for, you know, more of the world bests to achieve things. And, it's just the case that you don't get you don't get a small handful of runners doing all of these things. You just don't. Mm-hmm. Most people are specializing. Most people are not doing cross country roads and track. And right. so it allows for some diversification, which I think is I think is fine for the sport because running is not one thing. We already know that. You've got so many different distances, you have so many different specialties within the the disciplines, but you but adding terrain into it is just another it's another way mm-hmm. to showcase a different kind of strength as a runner. Speaking of which, for those of you that have recently started listening to the podcast, when we do World of Running, we pretty much only talk about distance events and or maybe like <laughs> we don't talk about sprinters eight hundred up, and that's just because that's what we specialize with this podcast. Not because we don't love the other track and field events. It might be. Because it would take we too don't long. Love. The other, no, I'm kidding. Stop. I'm kidding. We love it all, um, but we don't have time on the podcast to go through all of the different disciplines. So it is not a track and field podcast in terms of how we have tried to focus our attention. Yeah, it's uh, it's running and specifically longer running. There's a lot going on this week, a lot. We had many championships going down, including the UK championships. And briefly, I just want to touch on some of the highlights. Gemma Riki broke the championship record, the British championship record in the 800 in a time of 158.24, which is really great at this time of year to be seeing these sub two times. It's very, usually they kind of hover around too flat. So that's really fast. Especially indoors. In, yeah. Under two minutes indoors is a rare occurrence. And it should be noted that while the world has been enamored with the big three in the women's 800 meters right now, a thing, Mo, Mary Mora and Keely Hodgkinson, Gemma Riki is one of the best of all time. And yeah. yet has not been able to hit that medal stand like those other three. Yeah. Well, she didn't. Um, well, I guess for the British championships, I think she won yeah. one like in 2019. So mm-hmm. she had a dry spell. Yeah. Yeah. But point being, she's looking fast and looking fit and that's a great thing to be in an olympic year Mm -hmm. also at the uk champs unsurprisingly laura muir won the 3000 
And previous podcast guests, Cindy Sember, who was Cindy Ophelia when we interviewed her, won the 60 meter hurdles. And this is just a little side note because this is news. British Athletics is sending very few athletes again to the world, even though they're hosting. She's talking about the World Indoor Championships. Yes. Yeah, I didn't say that. No, but that's okay. It's coming very soon, by the way. It's coming. And it's going to be lots of fun. Yeah. Two weeks. Nine individual women and a four by four team and six individual men. So just not very many. And there's some criticism of that. That's not just in distance events. That's their whole entire track and field squad. Yeah. And they're allowed to send because they're the host team. They can have someone in every event. So it's just a little sad that they're not yeah. working on their youth development or like the those that are coming up in the ranks. Like I think it would be helpful for them to get championship experience, whether or not they showcase a top meddling finish. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's it's a mystery to me. Um, I think I kind of understood like the you know we don't want to send tons and tons of people across the world um kind of thinking to like tokyo olympics and then the world championships in in oregon um yet at the same time i I still didn't understand it then now the championship is in scotland and they're still sending probably the smallest team of any of the qualified nations you know those that could send multiple athletes um that is stupid so any any UK athletics people listening right now, you are being stupid. Your athletes have a chance to compete at a world stage and you're depriving of them that for what? You have not yet presented a reason that anyone in the world understands and would get behind. That's not okay. One of these six men is Adam Fogg. Adam. Yes, who what helped Zach at the Baltimore Marathon. He is an Under Armour athlete. Thanks again for that, Adam, by the way. And yeah. great work yes. indoor track season this year. Really seeing some improvements and hope to see more of that in an Olympic year, too. Very exciting. Mm-hmm. Now on to the U.S. championships. We're going to start with day one. I think it'd be nice to go chronologically. In the women's 3,000, there was a dominant victory by Ellie St. Pierre. No surprise. It was not a surprise. She won by nine seconds in a time of 854.40. Josette Andrews of the OAC was 903. A distant second. <laughs> yeah, but still, you know, it's possible she'll be able to go to World Championship. She's 30th on the list, and they only take how many? 15. 15. It's so, but it's possible. It's possible. She might squeak in. We'll yeah, see. well, in that, in that situation, um, because it's an indoor championship, a substantial percentage of qualified participants don't come to this event. That's just the nature of world indoors all the time. And so, for example, some of the United States best distance runners skip this every year because they're focused on events that are in close proximity, like trying to qualify in the 10,000 meters or something for the Olympics. So as it were, yeah, we'll see. Josette Andrews may in fact be able to compete and we'll let you know how it goes Mm -hmm. if she does. Men's 3,000 meter run, again, an unsurprising race. Yard Nagoose claimed the expected victory, and he took the lead up with about 300 to go. Yeah. Dude. And kicked, really. Dude's a beast. <laughs> yeah, his so kick is amazing. We get a Nagoose and Kerr uh, matchup yes. potentially now at the World Indoor Championships. Josh Kerr, the defending world 1,500 meter champion, as well as, if you recall, broke the, 30, the two mile indoor world record just recently is has announced that he's running the 3000 yard Nagus is running the 3000 for both of them it's their off distance that they are milers true and true but um because they're doing this it's kind of fun because so Nagus certainly has the potential to uh break some world records right now he's been very close in the indoor mile for instance um and you just you just don't usually see a clash like this at a world championship indoors. And I think it's a little interesting. Josh yeah. Kerr's been talking so much smack about Jacob Ingebrigtsen, but he hasn't said anything about Yard of Nagus. Of course, he's not going to say it because Nagus isn't a chump like Ingebrigtsen. <laughs> Ingebrigtsen thrives on the, insulting his competition and getting into these social media debacles with everyone. The I rivalries. He's he's a reality TV star. What it's do you expect? True. He is so a reality TV star. It's yeah. 
And and Josh Kerr just eats it up. He loves it himself. You can't blame him. It's just a lot of fun. But anyway, no, that's going to be cool. We're looking forward to that. Olin Hacker was in second place, and same story as with the ladies. Nagus has the standard, but Hacker is 36 on the list. Less likely, by the way, yeah. that he's going to go, just knowing who has started announcing they're doing the 3,000. Um, more people are doing the 3,000 that would be otherwise doing the 1,500. And so that's always tough then because for the 3,000 meter people, they're like, ah, you should stick with your event because this one was mine. But eh, it happens. Well, this is I have a couple more notes from day one. They're just interesting. Nia Akins, who was actually one of the favorites for the 800 meter race at the U.S. Championships, lost her shoe in her prelim on the first day. And she still won her heat. Yeah. But she was running without a shoe. That's tough. At altitude and still won her heat. So that was impressive. And also, Janelle Branch, my former teammate at Cornerstone, was runner-up in the women's race walk. And then some of the other non-distance events. Oh, but those interesting. are sprints. Yeah. We don't well, talk Grant about Holloway, he beat his own world record, and Tia Jones tied her uh, okay. t- tied a less than week old women's record in the short hurdles. In the short hurdles. No, was it hurdles? Well, Tia just, Jones literally yeah, is the, the short hurdles, hurdles yeah. but um, yeah, in the short the short sprints here. Okay, day two. Yes. Day two. Okay. Men's 1500 was exciting, Um, but it's just once again, the answer to what's the best way to run a 1500 in a championship style race. And the answer is in first place the whole time, because it's the easiest. You have to do the least amount of ultimately the least amount of work because no one remember in, in a super fast race where it's like, you know, everyone's all out the whole time running as fast as they possibly can. You don't really want to be in the front because you're having to do the extra work for everyone else. They can just kind of sit behind you and chill. But in a championship race, you're not really working that any harder than anyone else behind you because you're not running all out yet. Well, Cole Hawker did it the second best way. Like if leading it is the first best way, what Cole Hawker did is the second best way. He did essentially lead. No, he didn't. He was not in first place the whole time, but he was on the rail the whole time and didn't have to ever move around anyone because he was able to pass on the inside. That was lucky. No, it happens a fair bit, especially indoors with the banked track because corners are just a little bit wonkier. They're tighter and such. Anyway, my point is... That's the way you want to do it. You don't want to have to make any passes if you can help it, in especially indoors. And Cole Hawker did just that. He won the race in an astounding finishing 400, um, which is not at all unexpected. 54 seconds on a banked track, 200-meter track. It's very fast and hard to do. Yeah. So his last 400 was 54. His last 800 was 152. That's the guy. Yeah. That's what he does. So Cole Hawker beating out, by the way, Hobbs Kessler, the young standout with Adidas. And we know that we've been talking about Kessler a fair bit lately because he's just been running fast Mm -hmm. and competing well. And so he finished second to then qualify for his first ever U.S. team in a track and field championships. And mm-hmm. so that's exciting. But it was very narrow because well, <laughs> Henry Wynn was third and Kessler only beat him by, by 0.05. So it was a very close finish. Very exciting race. And Kessler did enough work early on to have enough of a gap because Wynn was coming on strong, but uh, he held him off. Another one like the 3,000 that was unsurprising was the women's 1,500. Nikki Hiltz won over Emily McKay. This is Hiltz's Third straight Third. national title between in indoor and outdoor 1500s. There's no doubt about it. Hiltz knows how to win championship races in these kinds of things. I think the only regrettable moment here is that we didn't get to see another opportunity against all the A-lister milers, who, as we've noted, Hiltz has beaten a number of times now. Um, but this one was a, a pretty straightforward victory and wasn't likely anyone was going to win it but Hiltz. So... Mm-hmm takes away another championship now the question is and this is this is where the criticism has fallen um these u.s standouts running these milers running great at the u.s level have a hard time meddling at the world stage but between hilts and hawker and kessler and others really hope can we do it we can see some indoor medals here so we'll see yeah men's 800 bryce hopple and another story of dominance won his third straight U.S. indoor title and fifth straight overall with outdoor and indoor in the 800, 147.67, which is great for early early season. 
I know it's the championship, but it still kind of is early. Isaiah Harris was second place. Again, not a surprise. So, yeah, that's pretty straightforward for the men's 800. The women's 800 wasn't so much straightforward. No, in fact, all the things that you thought were going to happen didn't. And all the things that happened, you didn't think were going to happen. Yeah. That's... It was pretty exciting to see Allie Wilson win her first U.S. title in a time of two flat, 0.63. And Addie Wiley, the youngster, was second place in a time of two flat, leading the whole time. Yeah. So that's Very... where I say things you didn't expect. So Addie Wiley, in her first U.S. championship as a professional runner, um, just decides to set the tone of the race. And as the rookie, she, in fact basically pulled it off. I mean, she didn't win the race, but she finished second, which means a berth on the U.S. team for the World Championship. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty impressive. The, the sad story of the day was the story of Nia Akins, who was third. And, of course, the favorite coming in, that's disappointing. Also thrown off her game with her shoe coming off the day, be day before, not knowing how that affected her and how her feet felt after that. Who knows? But that was disappointing for her. Mm -hmm. A little side story about Allie Wilson is that she recently left Atlanta Track Club after last year. And she she'd followed her coaches. The, she'd been with the club for a fair while. Yeah. And that's where her sponsorship was tied. Mm -hmm. So in leaving Atlanta Track Club, she also left her sponsorship situation. And that was a leap of faith. She wanted to go where she would get the most out of her herself and run her best times. And she followed her coaches to Indiana. And now she's unsponsored, but winning her first title. So it looks like it paid off for her. That was a big risk to take. Right on. So a quick side note, um, a, a trivia question for you. That Those are the distance events or distance-ish events. The indoor track circuit is shorter distances. As you might guess, people really don't want to run 10,000 meters on a small indoor Tiny track. track. <laughs> don't want to do it. And in fact, they don't even really like running 5,000 meters on an indoor track. Well, that depends on the person you ask because it's kind of nice to run in a climate-controlled environment. You don't get to do that very often on an outdoor track. So as it were, um, indoor track championships here for the United States were held in Albuquerque, which is, what's the elevation again? I always forget, 7,000? No, 3,000. Four, three to 4,000 feet of elevation, which is enough to now have an effect. Okay, so... If that is the case, here's the trivia question for you. Why do the announcers continue to repeatedly talk about the advantages of competing at altitude? Remember, this is a track and field meet, not just distance races. And here is the answer. Do you, you have your thought in your head? Hold it in your head. Why do the announcers talk about the advantages of altitude? Okay, here you go. One, because they don't care about distance running. <laughs> Because there are no advantages in running at altitude for distance runners. But less oxygen means, you know, less fuel for your muscles. But as it were, for everything other than distance running, the thinner air is an advantage. And it's fascinating when you hear them starting to talk about it because it's like, oh, yeah, I kind of forgot that, like, for a sprinter, it's nice when you don't have to run through as much air. <laughs> you can, in fact, move a little quicker for a jumper. You can jump a little higher when you don't have quite as much air pushing against you as you're going through and so on and so forth. Throwers can throw far, you know, all of that, right? Um, and, and the reason why that's the case is because in these short bursts, they it's anaerobic. They don't need oxygen to perform what they're doing, like a distance runner who does need oxygen. Um, and so as such, they can perform beyond their maximum at a sea level competition when they're at altitude it's it's kind of fun so the reason zach's bringing this up is because i texted him I'm like, <laughs> because we, i was on a work trip and i'm like why do they keep saying it's an advantage don't they know yeah. it's a disadvantage and he's like well this is why it's an advantage for these other events but kara goucher did mention yeah. that it was a disadvantage for the yes. distance runners when those races were going on we really don't like running at higher altitudes when we can help it as distance Except runners. for training. Well, yeah, some people like doing that. I don't, I don't like doing that. Very unpleasant. All right. Um, let's talk about just a couple other things. We're going to clean up the weekend here because there was still plenty more going on. And we'll give you the quick survey. First, Grant Fisher ran the number five all-time indoor 5,000 meters. Snap. And only missed the U.S. record by 0. .2 seconds. Point Which two, three, he owns, right? Does he no, own that record? No, Woody oh. Kincaid owns oh. that record. 
and Fisher just barely missed it after running, if you recall, a new American record in the 3,200, no, two mile. I keep wanting to say 3,200. That's a high school event. All right, third, in the two mile, Grant Fisher broke the American record. Now just missed it in the 5,000. Five days later, it's <laughs> basically the same He's week. in shape. He's in shape. Why did he do that? Well, he's talking about, okay, well, first of all, it's just nice to experience hard races in close proximity because that's what you have to do at a world championship or Olympics um, if you have to run, if you're doing multiple races, which he generally tries to. Um, and then at the same token, he's also gearing up for a 10,000 meter uh, qualification attempt for the Olympics. That's coming up here just in a few weeks. And so he needs to be, you know, primed for racing at his best. And this is one way to achieve that. In fact, it's one of the oldest and best ways to achieve that. So, so that's work, why he's Fisher. not at the U S championships and yeah. going to world championships is because he's got his eye on the 10,000 outdoors. Yeah. Well, and they actually also asked him, they're like, well, why didn't you just run the U S indoor championships? You, you, you know, you, you may have like taken home a U S title. This goes back to the whole point of like, clearly the indoor season doesn't mean as much to world-class athletes. Um, because he's like, ah, eh, you know, I just decided I'd rather do this one. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's it. Just not that important. All right, well, that's one person's story. Not everyone. So Grant Fisher, great work. We're looking forward to seeing how that 10,000 goes here soon. High schoolers are also running fast indoors. Are you surprised? Not at all, because <laughs> high schoolers are doing everything better than they have in the past right now. But this is interesting, especially. Drew Griffith, who won the Foot Locker, cross country championships this past year um drew griffith just set a new 3200 meter boys high school record in 838 and why that's notable is because that record actually is an 11 year old record was an 11 year old record and you recall we've been talking a lot about last year's senior class of high school boys because it was like insane and yet, in all of that insanity, none of them bested that record in Ooh, particular. Yeah. Which just shows you Drew Griffith is upper echelon. This kid is amazing. Hmm. So that was really cool. Very impressive work. And in the same token, in a very different way, Elizabeth Leachman also set a new girls high school 3200 meter record in the United States. Uh, but why this is notable, uh, especially notable, is because she's actually run faster than the previous record three times in the last three weeks snap that record set by caitlin tui arguably one of the greatest prep athletes of all time as well as one of the greatest collegians of all time and recently turned professional um leachman broke that record each time she ran the 3200 and she ran it once a week for the last three weeks. Um, so now she didn't lower it every time. The first one was faster than the second one, but the third one was fastest of all so far. So she's got a new record um, running the 3,200 meters faster than anybody else. And the last bit of news, I didn't mean to smile at the start because <laughs> I, I was reading what Zach had, the note so Zach tragedy. had written for oh, me. Oh, blame but it on Zach. No, 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 I'm not blaming on you. Zach wrote, smile while you no. read this terrible news. No. I'm a, I'm actually really sad about this because I think Moketeer is really fun to watch. I think he's a really fun gutsy runner. Gutsy's the case. And in championship racing, it's great to see it. So I'm very disappointed at this news that Moketeer is out for two years because of whereabout suspension. And he accepted the suspension. He's not trying to fight it. So set in stone. Yeah, so what it is, you're, you're familiar. We've talked about this before. You can get suspended for being guilty or you can get suspended for not showing up. Those are the two things with drug testing. Um, and not showing up is almost as bad as being guilty because first, they give you three strikes. And so it wasn't just that he missed a test once. Uh, he missed three of them in, a, in close proximity. And yes, it's true. It's a little bit tough because they don't tell you when they're going to show up. You just have to always be available. Actually, it's a really fascinating. I bet most of you listening don't really know much about how the anti-doping world works. But here's how it works. And I don't know this personally because there's not been a person on the planet who cared whether or not Well, you Zach get tested was... at races sometimes, but not <laughs> at our nope. home. Nope. Even then, nope. Because no one cares because Zach is not performing anything that worries anyone. But the point is, point is this is what they do. If you are on what they call the, 
I don't actually remember what they call it, but it's their list of people who need to be tested. If you're on that list and they tell you, they just say you're on the list. Um, then you have to go in to their system and report your whereabouts at all times. It'd and be really I'm hard not for my exaggerating. Job. I'm tra- I travel for my job. What if someone traveled like I do? And well, you say this? you say on the thing. You say I'm traveling to Orlando from. I'm leaving on this day. I'm coming back on this day at about this time. And so you have to do that. And you have to do that. Like if I'm going to go to the movies tonight, I got to put that in my whereabouts because it's not a time of day thing. They show up any time. I mean, not in the middle of the night. The, I thought they told you the window. There's a window. Yeah, they give they give you, but they, but it's very late notice. Uh. They'll say, all right, you need to be ready because someone's coming within this time. And that'll be like a day advance notice or something. You know, so like, no, if I'm going to the movies in an hour and I just decided that I don't have to probably report that because no one's just going to suddenly show up an hour from now. But if I want to go to the movies on Thursday, then I need to report. Point is very complicated. It's hard. And so granted that there are occasions where an athlete has a whereabouts violation that's accidental, but that's why they give you three strikes. If you are not there when the drug tester shows up, then that's a strike. And if you're not there the next time, that's strike two. And if you're not there the third time, it does not matter why you are suspended. And it's a two-year suspension for a whereabouts violation. A ban is only four years in most cases. Like a guilty verdict is only four years. So you get half of the consequence even if you're innocent. So that's why athletes are so incentivized to make sure they don't miss these whereabouts. So that, that raises the question, how does this happen then? And the answer is almost all the time because they're probably guilty of something and they don't want to be caught so they don't show up for the drug test because the four-year ban is worse than the two-year ban. And that never looks good. So when an athlete gets a whereabouts suspension, everyone goes, oh, well, they were cheating because what else are you going to suppose? It's just very unlikely that this was an accident three times in a row in a short span mm, of time. That's too bad. So there's been a lot of skepticism around Mo Kattir, as there always is with someone who just has a massive rate of improvement over a short period of time, which he did several years ago. Um, two, and, yeah, two or three years ago. Yep. And what people now look at with this is they're like, oh, well, maybe it was all true. Maybe maybe that was a little bit of an aided progression. But you don't know. And you can't you, – you, yeah. we don't – we are – we certainly are an innocent until proven guilty kind of uh, kind of people as we think about these things. But it, it's it's a very yeah, it's tough. Rough I hope moment. it's not true because I, I really do. As a competitor, he's fun to watch. He is fan. that. Yeah, he is. But well, we that... won't be seeing him in the Olympics this year. <laughs> that's tough. Well, that's all we have for the world of running this week. Thank you again to Nathan Martin for coming on the show. If you enjoyed this episode and you enjoyed our interview with Nate Martin, feel free to share it and tag us in it and tag Nate in it. I'm sure he'd like to hear it too. So comment on the stuff and yeah. say, I liked it because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We appreciate you staying connected and um, we appreciate you listening to us. Let's talk to you next week.